And now we're on. <laughs> I'd like to begin by thanking my lovely assistant, John Pater, who keeps me um, live and plugged in. Thank you. All these people taking care of each other, but especially me. Uh, we have, uh, I know Audrey was helping with the greeting this morning. We've got Marg and Alicia and Mike up in the sound booth. We've got John who prepared slides for us today on Zoom support. We have Doug and Gloria, so many amazing dedicated members of this congregation and we are so very, very grateful to them all. Um, and also Andrew Mills, you'll notice even more amazing things that are happening with our new projector. He is like the whiz of all time. And we are so grateful for all of the support uh, that's given to our congregation. As we begin this special time together, I would ask that you quiet yourselves and any electronic devices that you may have with you this morning. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts and love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings but are connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to the community, and to each other. Uh, one quick little announcement. Uh, you will notice in your email newsletter that there is a film fest happening on March 19th, which should prove to be extremely exciting with our new projector. Uh, so do keep track of your email newsletter for that one. We're going to begin our service this morning with a prelude. It's entitled Here Together. It's written by David M. Glasgow. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, religious, multi-generational community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritual questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, pursue the common good, and work for justice. We believe in the compassion of the individual heart, the warmth of community, and the search for meaning in our lives. As we gather with respect on Treaty 6 territory, I offer you these words by Mary Simon, Canada's 30th Governor General and the first Indigenous person to hold this position. Since the announcement of my appointment, I have been deeply touched by the responses from Canadians who have reached out to me. I have heard from Canadians who describe a renewed sense of possibility for our country and a hope that I can bring people together. I have heard from Canadians who have challenged me to bring a new and renewed purpose to the office of Governor General to help, Canada, help Canadians deal with the issues we are facing. It took time before I gained the self-confidence to assert myself and my beliefs in the non-Indigenous world. But when I came to understand that my voice had power and that others were looking to me to be their voice, I was able to let go of my fear. As members of our large and diverse Canadian family, we have to replace hurt 
with hope and find the grace and humility to stand together and move towards a more just and equitable future. Donna, would you like to light our chalice this morning? And I offer you these words by M. Susan Milner. Eternal God, Mother and Father, Spirit of Life, we gather grateful for the companionship of hearts and minds seeking to speak truth and love. We gather grateful for our heritage, for the men and women before us whose prophetic words and deeds make possible our dreams and our insights. We gather grateful for the gift of life itself, mindful that to respect life means both to celebrate what life is and to insist on what it can become. May we always rejoice in life and work to cultivate a sense of its giftedness, but may we also heed the call to transformation and growth. May we find in ourselves the strength to face our adversities, the integrity to name them, and the vision to overcome them. May we honor in pride the heroines and heroes of our past, but may we also keep company with the fallen, the broken, and the oppressed. For in the dazzling of noonday's heat, and in the star-studded shimmering of night's rich blackness, we are them. Thank you, Donna. And of course, being International Women's Day service, the hymn that we have to begin with is hymn number 109 in your green, uh, dark green hymn books. Uh, for those of you online, your text will be coming up on your screens. And for those in the sanctuary, yes, we will be having the text on our screen as well. I would invite you to rise as you are willing and able as we sing together hymn number 109.
Julia Ward Howe wrote this poem in the aftermath of the American Civil War in the 1800s. And she has become an icon for women, women's movement and peace through the centuries. This is her poem, The Mother's Day Proclamation by Julia Ward Howe. Arise then, women of this day. Arise, all women who have hearts, whether our baptism be of water or of tears. Say firmly, we will not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands will not come to us reeking with carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. We, the women of one country, will be too tender of those of another country to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. From the bosom of the devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, disarm, disarm. The sword of murder is not the balance of justice. Blood does not wipe out dishonor, nor violence indicate possession. As men have often forsaken the plow and the anvil at the summons of war, let women now leave all that, that may be left of home for a great and earnest day of counsel. Let them meet first as women to bewail and commemorate the dead. Let them solemnly take counsel with each other as to the means whereby the great human family can live in peace. And each bearing her own time, the sacred impress, not of Caesar, but of God. Thank you, Marilyn. We have a brand new hymn to share with all of you today. It's called, There is a Love. It's printed on your little sheet that you should have. And the text, of course, will be coming up again for those of you online. This is actually gonna be our hymn of the month. Uh, there are two verses, and I think as we go through the month, we will be spending even more time with this particular hymn and letting it grow and evolve. Um, I would invite you to stand as you are willing and able as we join in singing, There is a Love. Peace Like a River, Strength Like a Mountain by Stephen M. Schick. Nature provides ready metaphors for peace and justice. Jesus' peaceful kingdom is described as a mustard seed that grows into a large bush, providing shelter to all. 
the Hebrew prophet Amos cried for justice to roll down like water. And we sing, I've got peace like a river and strength like a mountain. But it takes more than mere words to join nature to action. Truly experiencing ourselves as a force of nature in all its varied circumstance is something beyond just symbolism. The next breath I take is not a metaphor. It is, if I am mindful of it, a reminder that I myself am a force of nature, linked to all that exists on our living, breathing planet. In many indigenous peoples' traditions, the medicine wheel honors the natural forces that can guide us into harmony with all living things. Our suffering, our victories, and the passions and beliefs that move us to action are part of a larger system that appears at times to seek harmony and at times to tear us apart. In engaging each fully, we become forces of nature. Officials laughed when Wangari Matai said that the women of her country would plant 15 million trees. The natural strength of the trees they planted began flowing through the women who planted them, and they discovered their own power. Through the simple planting of trees, women who lived in poverty and despair began to transform the landscape and themselves. The trees helped reduce soil erosion and water pollution. They provided shade and produced sustainable crops. Wangari Matai's vision transformed the landscape of Kenya, and the Green Belt movement she started has spread to more than 30 countries. Growing and producing enough food for their families gave Kenyan women a greater vision and unexpected courage. They began to challenge their leaders' dictatorial and environmentally destructive policies. They faced brutal oppression with a strength they could not have imagined when the first trees were planted. When you plant a tree and you see it grow, Matai said, something happens to you. You want to protect it and you value it. The same thing happens with a vision.
now as a white middle-aged woman with a very comfortable lifestyle named Karen, I am pretty much the living embodiment of the meme that has circulated lately to talk about those who are not awake to the inequities in our world. And so it is with tremendous gratitude and humility that I read the very powerful words of Maya Angelou. You might write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me into the very dirt, but like dust, I will rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still, I'll rise. Do you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my mournful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard, because I walk through life like I've got gold mines digging in my backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I'll rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I'll rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slaves. I rise. I rise. I rise.
March is our canvas month at UCE, when we ask our congregation to make a financial pledge to help keep our church going for another year. And each week this March, as part of Canvas, we've asked one of our contributors to talk about why UCE is important to them and why they pledge their financial support. So today, to kick this off, we'll hear from Maria Jenkins. Good morning. My name is Maria Jenkins, my pronouns are she and her, and I have been a member of UCE for a bit more than 20 years. In that time, I've worn a variety of hats, member of the Ministerial Relations Committee, singer in Coriolis, youth advisor, and recently interim director of religious exploration. I was first brought to the church at about 16 by my dear friend Andrea Berman. I'm pretty sure some of you will remember her and her husband, Arthur, for a musical review. Coming into the sanctuary, seeing the banners, and hearing another member of the cast describe Unitarianism, admittedly not entirely accurately, as the nobody is wrong, everybody is right religion, uh, had me intrigued. So, of course, I helped myself to all of the About Us pamphlets available in the foyer. I had been raised somewhere between Catholic and Anglican. My dad's people were Eastern Orthodox. My mom's people were Presbyterian, I think. And we went to the Anglican church down the block because it was close and convenient. The idea of a church that didn't tell you what you were supposed to believe and was more interested in your actions appealed to me deeply. Even then, when I legit thought I was heterosexual and monogamous, I knew that I would be accepted here. And now, as a bisexual polyamorous person, I still know that. This church has brought so much that is good into my life. I find fulfillment working with our youth and singing with Coriolis. As a substitute teacher, my income can be pretty inconsistent. It has always been easier for me to contribute in other ways than financially. However, it feels very important to me to make even a small, regular contribution. In our church, it takes all kinds of people and all kinds of contributions to keep our community healthy and vibrant. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Everyone, your donations and participation provide the renewable energy that keeps this church running. Uh, UCE is entirely supported by the fundraising efforts of our members and friends. And your annual pledges and donations directly affect staffing levels and the programs that we can offer. So please return your pledge by the end of March so that it can be included in planning the budget that will present, be presented to all of us to vote on in uh, May at our annual general meeting. Pledge forms were mailed out to all donors along with their tax receipt, but if you didn't get those or your dog snacked on them, um, they're also available in the lobby in the back or they're online on our website as well. And in addition to supporting this community, we also donate half of the unidentified cash contributions each month to an outside charity. And for March, we're sharing our abundance with the Coun International Council of Unitarians and Universalists, more commonly known as ICUU. The ICUU connects people across the globe to learn, to share resources, to develop leaders, inspire and support in building spiritual community. They are truly instrumental in supporting and nurturing fledgling UU groups and encouraging the development of liberal religion. Offering plates are located at the exits here um, for the people in the sanctuary and for those of you online, I encourage you to go to the ICUU website and donate there. And we thank everyone for your generosity of spirit and action 
through all we do here in this community and the wider world, we are involved in the important spiritual work of creation and compassion. And so in gratitude for that, let's sing together from you I receive. going to be moving into a time of meditation. So I invite you to take a couple of deep, long, cleansing breaths with me. Having a bit of, oh, there we go. Okay. So in case you missed that, I invited you to breathe. <laughs> we'll all breathe together. And I wanted us to do that just to embody ourselves. So I invite you to let the chair, the couch, the floor, the bed, whatever it is that is supporting you, let it support you. Lean into it. Let your muscles go. And if you're sitting, I invite you to, if you wish, to press your feet down into the ground. Notice how that feels. And we will begin our meditation with Coriolis singing, gathering together in community. We continue our meditation time in words. Boundaries by UU minister and poet Lynn Unger. The universe does not revolve around you. The stars and planets spinning through the ballroom of space dance with one another quite outside of your small life, you cannot hold gravity or seasons, even air and water. 
inevitably evade your grasp. Why not then let go? You could move through time like a shark through water, neither restless nor seeking, ceasing, absorbed in and absorbing the native element. Why pretend you can do otherwise? The world comes in at every pore, mixes in your blood before breath releases you into the world again. Did you think the fragile boundary of your skin could build a wall? Listen, every molecule is humming its particular pitch. Of course you are a symphony. Whose tune do you think the planets are singing as they dance? The universe does not resolve, revolve around you. The stars and planets spinning through the ballroom of space dance with one another quite outside of your small life. You cannot hold gravity or seasons, even air and water inevitably evade your grasp. Why not then let go? You could move through time like a shark through water, neither restless nor ceasing, absorbed in and absorbing the native element. Why pretend you could do otherwise? The world comes in at every pore, mixes in your blood before breath releases you into the world again. Did you think the fragile boundary of your skin could build a wall? Listen, every molecule is humming its particular pitch. Of course you are a symphony. Whose tune do you think the planets are singing as they dance? And we'll have a few moments of silence. And then the choir will bring us out of our silence together. I chose the picture of a campfire as we listen to gathering together. What a better place. And we look forward to summer when we can gather together around a campfire. I don't know about you, but what's been on my heart this week and in my news feed is um, the war in, in Ukraine. So as I invite you to, I'm going to light a candle for Ukraine first, and then I'm going to invite folks, if they wish, to come and light candles. We could probably bring the lights down a little bit, because I've changed the order of things, and so I'm probably going to get into a bit of trouble, but that's okay. Thank you. So I invite you now to line up, if you wish, take a taper, 
light a candle and then extinguish it into the water here and drop your taper. Uh, if you wish to light a candle this morning for whatever is on your heart or mind, either in joy or in sorrow, and I will lead off with a candle for Ukraine.
Robert, if you could find one more to light for all of us that have unspoken, unlit, if we can find one that'll light. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm, there's a lot on our hearts and minds today. Go ahead. Thank you to everyone that lit a candle. And I'm so grateful to be part of this beautiful choir this morning as well. So thank you. In two days, it will be International Women's Day, as Gordon mentioned. But it's going to be on Tuesday, not Wednesday. And that's the day we are celebrating here this morning. And it's a day to celebrate the achievements of women. Perhaps, though, more than the achievements, this day is one where we can take a moment and reflect on why we actually have a women's, International Women's Day. We all know the statistics. In many countries, probably this one too, women make less than men for equal work. In some countries, women are still not allowed to get a driver's license. Women are most of the victims of domestic violence and trans women at an even higher rate. As soon as it was safe to do so, women began fighting for their right to vote, to have a profession, to go to an Ivy League school, to become ordained. Growing up, I had very few role models. I thought only men were allowed to be ministers. There was the odd woman in the pulpit, though, like Amy Semple McPherson and Catherine Kuhlman. I did go to a Catherine Kuhlman revival one time at, in Vancouver at one of the big places. It was something else, let me tell you. However, there was a really interesting example of women preachers in the 19th century. They were called the Iowa Sisterhood. Has anyone heard of the Iowa Sisterhood? They are part of our Unitarian Universalist heritage and tradition. And so from the Tapestry of Faith, Faith Like a River, a program of, on Unitarian Universalist history for adults. Some of the first women ordained in the United States were Universalist or Unitarian. At the turn of the 21st century, a majority of Unitarian Universalist ministers were women, surprisingly enough. However, the path for women ministers in our faith tradition has not been easy. Of those early women who achieved ordination, few were allowed to serve as full-time ministers. Others were relegated to small, struggling parishes or assistants alongside their clergy husbands. Despite the lack of encouragement at the end of the 19th century, so that's the 1800s, a group of extraordinary women claimed their role as ordained ministers. Following the Women's Ministerial Conference organized by Julia Ward Howe, we heard from her earlier, in 1875, 21 Unitarian women founded the Iowa Sisterhood to serve churches throughout the Great Plains. Life was hard on the Plains states, with little glory to be earned by bringing liberal religion to the settlers of the area. Few male scholars from the seminaries of the East were attracted to the life. But if the plains were beyond the recognition of an Eastern religious hierarchy, they were also remote from that hierarchy's rules and controls. It was a place where women were accepted for their willingness to step in and serve, for the, for the tenacity in the face of hardship, and for their ministry. Perhaps one reason for the success of the Iowa Sisterhood was the caring pastoral approach these women brought to their churches. The sisterhood brought family matters into the church, not only on Sundays, but seven days a week with social events and classes on the domestic arts. 
Although Jenkin Lloyd-Jones, leader of the Western Conference of the Unitarians, was a staunch ally of the Iowa Sisterhood, the grassroots Western success of these women and their churches did not translate into wider denominational acceptance. The women were seen as an embarrassment among the clergy back in Boston. By the turn of the 20th century, society in general experienced a reassertion of male authority. Unitarianism's leaders began a concerted return to a more manly ministry in order to revitalize the denomination. The move of rural populations to the cities further undermined the sisterhood's efforts. The women were rushed into retirement. Others left for the suffrage movement. Yet they remained vocal to the end about the rights of women and the place of church in society. The Iowa sisterhood did not radically alter the possibilities for women in Unitarian ministry. But it, in its time and place, it was a shining vision of women called to ministry and men called to support their work. It's the end of the quote. That's from the Tapestry of Faith. You can find the Tapestry of Faith on the UUA website. There's tremendous resources there. Uh, it's pretty interesting that the men in Boston found this amazing group of women to be embarrassing to the denomination. Now, in most liberal Protestant denominations, women ministers have become the norm, case in point. In our Unitarian Universalist faith, now folks who are non-binary, trans, and gender expansive are now being fellowshipped, ordained, and settled into our congregations. I believe we were the first denomination to ordain and settle, op settle openly trans folk, openly poly polyamorous folk as well. And I'm really proud of our organization for that. Has anyone been on a commercial airplane lately? Who's usually in the cockpit? Not rhetorical. What is it? Man, my niece is a captain for WestJet and has been flying for them for many years. The captain's uniform has not changed to encompass different gender expressions. Her daughter said to her, why do they think you're a man, mommy? She has to wear a masculine shirt and tie to work. In 2014, she received a note from an unhappy customer. It was written on a WestJet napkin. That's not very long ago. The note said, to Captain WestJet, the cockpit of an airline is no, and no is underlined, place for a woman. A woman being a mother is the most honor, not as captain. We're short of Mothers, not captains, WestJet. P.S. I wish, I wish WestJet could tell me a fair lady is in the helm so I can book a different flight. As you can imagine, she put it on Facebook. And she replied to him on Facebook. And both the note and the, and the reply went viral. They got over... It was like unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. And uh, it was pretty much the talk of my family for a while. And I am a very proud auntie of this amazing woman. The point, I guess, is that even here in North America, we still have a long way to go to not think of certain paid positions, professions, vocations as belonging to a particular gender. Is that the point for International Women's Day? To continue to break down the barriers that keep people from realizing their full potential. I know I'm preaching to the choir, quite literally. 
And I know that Unitarian Universalists have been at the forefront of the frontage movement, fighting for equal pay, for equal work, basically standing up for equality of all genders. What did Ruth Bader Ginsburg say? I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. Also this from her. I remember envying the boys long before I even knew the word feminism because I liked shop better than cooking or sewing. Choices, we all need equal choices. Perhaps the, that's the crux of what this day is about. The choices need to be the same for all of us. Feet need to come off the necks of everyone, regardless of their gender or anything else about them. Another time we can talk about intersectionality, a concept coined by Kimberly Crenshaw that basically says that the more marginalized identities a person holds, the more discrimination they encounter and the more limiting of choices come their way. But for today, let's be grateful for all the positive changes that have created more equitable solutions and situations for millions of people. We can still do better, of course. We can be careful to use inclusive language, examine our own biases, and watch out for the margins of society where people don't have equal access to resources and opportunities. Our principles ask us to learn, to do better, and to be better. International Women's Day gives us an opportunity for a checkup and a check in on how we think and feel about women's equalities, equality, and basically equality in general. Our principles entice us into examining ourselves to discover how we are promoting and affirming the inherent worth and dignity of every person and when we are not. Let us continue to do this work in love for it is indeed holy work and it brings us to a holy place. So may it be, amen. Speaking of holy places, we will now sing 1008, when our heart is in a holy place. The words will be on your screen, in behind me, already are, 1008 in the teal hymn book. Thank you. 
someone lit the chalice, would you care to extinguish it for us, please, Donna? Thank you. We extinguish the chalice with words by Barbara Cheatham. Bring happiness. And now we take our leave. But before we gather here again, may each of us bring happiness into another's life. May we each be surprised by the gifts that surround us. May each of us be enlivened by constant curiosity. And may we remain together in spirit till the time we are together again. And I'd like to thank the choir for letting me sing with you and for singing so beautifully. Thank you, Karen and Gordon, for the lovely service. Thank you. You can, you can be seated. Thank you, Donna. And we have a special thank you this morning. Um, we would like to thank Edwina and Gaylord. Edwina for being our head teller for I don't know how many years and has just recently stepped down from that position. And I would like to call Susan Rattan up to speak to this. Edwina and Gaylord or Edwina, would you like to come up? I believe um, Edwina said she's been the teller since Bernie Keeler, is that right? Since uh, Stan Calder. Stan, Cal Stan Calder, which is to say a very, very long time. <laughs> and what it means is you have to be very good on techie stuff, but it also means you have to come every Sunday, whether you feel like it or not. And she does, and they do. And uh, that's a huge commitment over many years. And uh, she, she, the two of them have now been helping David to learn how to do it. Uh, this is the end of the month, apparently, at the end of the month, money-wise, and it's all sorts of special things happen that don't ask me, but she's, she and David have figured it out. So thank you very, very much. Someone said to me that in relinquishing this position, at least I didn't have to die to do it. <laughs> because it was by surprise that um, I acquired the position uh, when we lost Stan. Um, it's interesting, actually, as uh, Rosemary was talking about women in positions, um, we also have a niece who is a pilot. And when I think back over the years of this particular position in uh, being the, the money counter, I'm the first woman to do it. It's always been men who have taken it. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm going to miss a number of aspects of it, but it's going to allow me to be more social and involved in other things with the church. And I certainly couldn't have done it without my helper. And now, do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break and all things can mend, but not with time as they say with intention. So go and love intentionally, love extravagantly, and love unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in all of us, in all of you. Amen. And we will sing our um, postlude, go into the sacredness. No, you can sit. We're not. We're do not doing chat. Carry the flame. We're going to listen. 
<laughs> to the choir saying go into the sacredness and then we're going to do carry the flame And now, please join in singing Carry the Flame. Make a circle if we can, or sort of, but don't hold hands. <laughs> 